Human beings are capable of horrifying, spine-chilling deeds. We've all heard the worst evils inflicted upon innocents, and every year a new case stuns us into silence, making us wonder if there's a line humans won't cross. In this series, we're going to look at disturbing real-life crimes. This is Cold-Blooded Crimes. Maria del Rosio Alfaro, also known as Rosie, was born on October 12th, 1971. She was born and raised in the Barrio, a Spanish-speaking neighborhood in Anaheim, California. Maria came from a family of high poverty. She lived with her mother, and her father was never in the picture. At an early age, she was exposed to a dangerous lifestyle filled with drugs and crime, and it didn't take long for her to get dragged into this pit. Maria's childhood was lost when she started taking drugs at the age of 12. In less than a year, she was addicted to cocaine and heroin. She would steal from stores with her friends or ask someone else to steal for them. Any money they got was used to buy drugs. Maria's mother, Silvia Melendez Alfaro, worried over her young child and tried to help her the best way she could. She enrolled her into several drug treatment programs and even sent her to live with her grandmother in Mexico for a few months. Unfortunately, none of it worked. As soon as Maria returned, she was back to her destructive self, applying heavy makeup, dressing in dirty, inappropriate clothes, and skipping school. Maria was out of control. By the age of 14, Maria needed a way to fund her expensive habit. The stealing wasn't enough. She had no job and no one to give her money. So she turned to prostitution, sleeping with suppliers in exchange for drugs. At around the same time, Maria began dating Manuel Cueva and got pregnant by him. At 15, she gave birth to her first child, Daniel. Maria was a single mother now, with very little support from her partner. This, however, didn't stop her from continuing to take drugs, and not long after, she was pregnant again with Manuel's second baby. During her second pregnancy, Maria spent a short time living with the Wallace family. She was high school friends with April Wallace, who lived with her mother, Linda, and her younger sister, Autumn. The family welcomed Maria in, feeling sorry for her as she had nowhere to stay at the time. After moving back home, Maria and April stayed friends, and Maria would often visit the Wallace home. However, April grew tired and weary of Maria's habits. She couldn't trust her anymore, so she cut off their friendship. A few years down the line, on June 15th, 1990, their paths crossed again. Maria was 18 now, a mother of two children, and pregnant once again with twins. She was still plagued by her addiction, and on this particular day, she was craving to get high. She left her boyfriend's house with their infant son, Manny, to go buy drugs. Maria went to a nearby apartment, where she left her son with a man she knew, and proceeded to get high with another woman, Sabrina. Later on in the afternoon, another one of Maria's friends came by the apartment, Antonio Reynoso, who was released from prison the previous day. Antonio joined the girls in getting high until they ran out of their supply, but Maria still wanted more. This is when she came up with the idea of going to rob the Wallace home. Maria, her son, Antonio, and another unidentified man drove to the Wallace home. Upon arriving, they parked the car in the driveway and she went inside. Maria knocked on the door and Autumn, April's nine-year-old sister, came to open the door for her. Autumn left school early that day and was home alone waiting for her mother and sister to return. She was coloring and cutting out paper dolls before Maria arrived. Autumn did not hesitate to let Maria in. She recognized her as April's friend and trusted her as she lived with them at some point. Autumn was too young to know of Maria's problems. Maria's plan to rob the house hadn't changed, but she didn't want to leave any witnesses. So she asked to use the bathroom, picking up a knife on the way. Once inside, she lured in Autumn, pretending she needed help cleaning a lash curler. Autumn went inside and Maria attacked, stabbing her with the knife. She then went through the home, grabbing as much as she could before running out and driving off with the two men. Later that evening, April returned home to find the house was a mess. She went around looking and noticed the TV and mirror in her bedroom were missing. 
and clothes were thrown around the room. He called for Autumn and looked around but couldn't find her. Scared and confused, April ran out of the house and went to the neighbours. Not long after, Linda returned home too and April told her what she found. The home was burglarised and Autumn was missing. They went back in the house to look for Autumn and noticed more things were gone, including the telephone. April had to go to the neighbours to use their phone and call the police. While she was gone, Linda found Autumn. Her body was laying in the back bathroom, in a pool of blood. She could not believe what she was seeing. Her world was shattered. The police soon arrived and began their investigation. After interviewing the neighbours, witnesses said they saw a goldish bronze Monte Carlo parked in the driveway earlier that day, with two Hispanic men standing next to it. One of the men was holding a young child. Strange enough, Maria returned to the crime scene that night. She was with her boyfriend Manuel and their son. She asked the lead investigator, Tom Giffen, to speak with April, but he declined. However, seeing Maria and her child triggered thoughts in the investigator's mind, and he recalled the witness accounts from that day. The next day, fingerprints matching Maria's were found in the bathroom, and she was called in for an interview. She denied having any involvement in the crime and was released after. Maria was now worried and knew she had to get away. She prepared a bag and clothing at a friend's house, Maria Ruelas, where she occasionally stayed and asked her to leave the bag outside, planning on picking it up early the next morning for a trip to Mexico. However, she never showed up. On June 24th, the police managed to get hold of the bag from Ruelas, Maria's friend. Inside the bag, they found April's boots, which were missing from the robbery, and Maria's tennis shoes, which had bloodstains on them. This was the evidence they needed to get a warrant and arrest Maria. The interview conducted after lasted over four hours and was videotaped. Maria confessed to having burglarized the Wallace home and stabbing Autumn. Throughout her confession, she insisted she acted alone and Antonio never entered the home. However, she was inconsistent about the whereabouts of the second man. At first, she said he remained outside and only got out of the car to help her with the stolen items. Then she implied that he may have entered the house to help her take things out, but she would not identify him either. The police also tried to get information out of her on the car they used that day, but her description didn't match the witness accounts. Maria was adamant on remaining the sole perpetrator in this crime, despite opportunities she was given by the detectives. Several people testified in court on the lifestyle Maria led, and her severe drug addiction. Antonio testified to going with Maria to the Wallace home, but apparently he was made to believe that the items taken from the home belonged to Maria, as she'd stayed there before, and that he wasn't aware Maria stabbed Autumn. The autopsy performed on Autumn's body showed she was stabbed more than 50 times on her head, neck, and upper body. DNA testing showed that the blood found on Maria's tennis shoes matched Autumn's blood, and the shoe print matched the ones left in the pool of blood. Her finger and palm prints were also found in 26 places around the home. This further confirmed she was alone in the house at the time of the crime. In court, Sylvia begged the judge to spare her daughter's life. She blamed the drugs for Maria's actions and sought empathy for the children Maria would leave behind. This, however, did not sway the judge or jury. Maria was tried and convicted of first-degree murder during a burglary and robbery. At the end of the penalty phase of the trial, the jury deadlocked 10-2 on the sentence of death. It was therefore ruled a mistrial. A second jury then returned with a unanimous verdict of death. Maria was sentenced to die in the gas chamber and became the first woman in Orange County to be condemned to death row. An appeal was made to higher courts, but in 2007, the California Supreme Court voted unanimously to uphold Maria's death sentence. Autumn's mother was glad for this decision, as it gave her the closure needed to mourn her child in peace. Till now, Maria remains in death row, awaiting her punishment. Do you think the drugs were to blame for Maria's actions? And how much consideration should this be given when a young, innocent life is lost for no reason? Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more videos like this one. Until next time, 